Thank you guys for being with us. It's 4.43 exactly. We were told to be on stage and here we are. Um, and it's, it's an interesting talk today. So, you know, building your own market, winning by building your own market. When a lot of people think about entrepreneurship, this is what they think of. Today, if you walk around this venue, I'd say most of the people building things, and this is still a great way to make money and to hire people and to do business, they're doing a new version of something that already exists. So it's Facebook, but safer, or it's Uber, but it's cheaper, Bitcoin, but more efficient. But both of you here, Sai, Herman, you know, you've actually built a market from scratch. I think that is just kind of the heart of entrepreneurship and something that we should uh, dig into in the next 30 minutes. So. Who do we have with us? Um, Sai is the founder of MPL, Mobile Premier League. It's an esports and digital gaming platform. And I've lived in both India and Indonesia, so I know MPL well. I've seen you on the cricket shirts of the national team. But for anyone else who perhaps hasn't seen it in action, this is a firm with 80 million users, and it's not even on Play Store. So 80 million people have gone out of their way to find MPL and use it. Um, $2.3 billion valuation, so clearly are creating a new market. And Herman, you are the co-founder and CEO of Improbable. And you, I've heard you speak before, and you'll talk a lot about the matrix. You'll compare what you're doing to Hogwarts. <laughs> when you did a column for us at The Economist, you compared what you were doing to a 15,000-year-old temple in southern Turkey. <laughs> so I'm imagining you can tell us a lot about how you convince people about creating and building something new. So being on the founder stage, hopefully we'll have some real lessons from these founders. And let's start from the top. Um, you know, so I go first. 2018, you start this company. How do you create demand for something new? You know, DAUs, MAUs is what everyone cares about. How do you go about generating demand? Yeah, so I think um, I think India at that time was in a very unique uh, space. It's, it's, uh, you know, internet had become really cheap uh, just because of geo launching like a year back and data data prices plummeted, and so the biggest hindrance for people to actually use your product actually went away because now people had really cheap data so they could actually use the product. So that th that out of the way, I think the only thing left at that point was to create attention to just give people something that they've never heard of before. And I think in India, people always played games. In fact, India is the second largest country in the world by DAOs. In terms, sorry, downloads, not DAOs. DAOs also probably it might be the largest. Uh, so, so people already kind of played games, but they never really had this value prop in front of them where you know, they could participate in these really crazy tournaments, like really large tournaments where people could enter like a million people tournament. And you know you had you had prizes on the other side of the tournament. So that was like a cut through value proposition. And back then in India, even YouTube was just taking off in terms of uh, creators and creator you know communities and so on and so forth. So we worked with a lot of creator communities to actually just spread the word. And I think we launched in September 2018, and by December 2018, we were at about a million DAO. Uh, and it was it was it was really crazy. And, and I think. In India right now, I mean, back then, if you had a cut-through cut -through value proposition uh, and, and you, you chose a vehicle to communicate, which is not mainstream. For example, what I mean by mainstream is Facebook advertising, Google ads, even television ads is pretty mainstream. So your dollar is going to fight another one's dollar head to head. But whereas back then, working with creators on YouTube was actually not as mainstream. It's become fairly mainstream now in the last, say, five, six years. So we pretty much bought the entire inventory of the top five creators in India for like a good six months. So, so that, was, that actually worked out pretty well for us. So these guys together in a month produce north of 100 million views. So in wow. six months, we had 600 million views on, uh, you know, on telling people what MPL was. And it did help us that on the other side of the six months, we ended up signing Virat Kohli as a brand ambassador, who is, uh, for, 
for the uninitiated, Virat Kohli is pretty much like the Messi of cricket. Uh, not should I say more like the Ronaldo of cricket. And, and he's pretty much the biggest celebrity in India. So that pretty much carried us forward from there. Yeah. I mean, the next bit, convincing people. I mean, if you're creating a genuinely new market, you're going to have a spectrum from, I'd say, polite skeptics to genuine haters. I think, you know, especially when you talk about the metaverse. When I was coming here, I said to someone, I said, oh, what, what's the panel about? I said, the metaverse. And they said, isn't that done now? <laughs> you know, aren't we done with that? Wouldn't that just happen two years ago? And so if someone does sort of say, okay, I call bullshit. What is the metaverse? What are you guys doing? Is this just VR on acid? What do you say? So, I mean, I, I think I'd start with maybe a really different example of a use case that most people won't think of with the metaverse. Um, I can talk about this now because last year we sold our defense business, but we went from nothing to the fastest procured defense technology since World War II in Britain. We built simulations of war zones, and these were actively used um, in recent conflicts, which meant that now me and my co-founders are sanctioned by Russia, which was a, a great vote of confidence, <laughs> I think. You know, if the metaverse is done, I'm glad we're, you know, at least Vladimir Putin still thinks it works, right? Um, but no, it, and it was a realization that actually, um, if you take the time to build much more sophisticated virtual worlds, worlds that thousands of people can interact in simultaneously, or where you can do at this point closer to 20 billion messages a second on the back end, the use cases are actually really surprising. I mean, one of the weird things is, um, you know, you obviously in the cricket space, we became the global partner for Major League Baseball. And this year we saw um, matches happen in the metaverse just a, just a month ago, broadcast for the first time, not only visually, but actually all the movements of the players interacting and thousands of fans in one space, all singing, talking, interacting. And it was very surprising, because I mean, before the event, if I'm honest, I was like, this isn't going to work. Like, the average age of a baseball fan is 54. This is going to not work. And to see thousands of people show up and then begin celebrating, and I think drinking from based on the voice <laughs> chat, um, you know, it showed us the potential. So I think the metaverse is, like any new frontier market, technology is only one ingredient. You need, as you've done in India, you need to find catalytic applications that really you know, feel obvious afterwards. And I think we're, you know, we've managed to create a very financially sustainable journey. We're now investing in other businesses. But um, you know, I don't think we've yet seen that, that kind of Pokemon Go moment for the metaverse. But I think it's on the horizon. And you know, even hearing the two of you speak, it's different building something in an emerging market. Um, you know, when you think about things that have been invented, you know, people say Galileo gets the credit for the telescope, but there was another guy who was playing around with uh, new technology and t different types of glass behind him. James Watt gets all the credit for the steam engine, but, you know, there was someone else, this British guy, who was basically creating a steam engine to pump water out of mines. I think in emerging markets, you often have to take an idea, like you said, gamers already existed, uh, but not, not in the cor correct way for this market. So, you know, especially in an emerging market, what's the enabling environment you need in order to create a market like you have? Right. So I think I can talk from a digital business's perspective. Like, you know, so I think uh, you need three things for any big digital business to take off in any market. You need, uh, you need the device, which is the end point. You need connectivity and you need payments. Uh, in, devices, of course, became fairly cheap. That is, the smartphone uh, you know, became fairly cheap, and people could actually uh, get a smartphone for as little as $70 or $80. In fact, the price is still plummeting. In fact, say if you take the amount of computing per dollar, that's only getting better and better in India. Uh, the second thing was, of course, connectivity, that the price of data went down, so therefore people could really start accessing it. But I think the third one is where I believe uh, you know, uh, India has kind of leapfrogged pretty much everyone else. It's basically payments. I think UPI uh, is, is, is probably the best thing that you know, India has done uh, from a startup standpoint over the last 10 years. I think I was telling you backstage, right? Uh, if, 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 if there were two ways in which India could have gone about promoting startups, one was making, maybe making a $10 billion fund and giving it to a bunch of companies. The other was probably UPI. And I think UPI was a 100 times better solution than that. What it fundamentally did was that it enabled anyone in India to make a payment to either a company or another person for pretty much zero interchange fee. Zero interchange fee is that there's no take, or should I say there's no value loss in the payment. So if I'm paying you 10 rupees, you're gonna get all of 10 rupees. The middleman can't essentially take anything. Now, what that meant was that people could now actually start transacting at uh, you know, amounts as small as two rupees, five rupees, 10 rupees. And that changed everything for especially digital businesses because digital businesses rely on microtransactions, transactions at scale where you know, millions and millions of people pay small amounts of money. And that couldn't happen in India because uh, in, in India before, because if you relied on say uh, a, you know a payment processor or popular payment processors like Visa or 
you know, PayPal or MasterCard and so on and so forth. Just the interchange fee itself will be way higher than, you know, the, the, the transaction that the person is making. So I think this was probably the biggest enabling infrastructure. And to give you context of how enabling this is, like, uh, I think we do, in India, India now does more digital transactions than most, probably, you know, most other countries combined. In fact, I think it's leapfrogged even China in terms of uh, digital transactions. I think that was a really, really pivot pivotal turning point. And as a consequence of that, you know, it was very easy to start building, uh, you know, building these, uh, these companies. And I think if, if there's anyone here who's building a digital business, I think it, now is the right time for them to actually think of an India strategy. I think this is pretty much, you know, everybody in 2008 thought that, you know, okay, there's still a, a, a few years to go before China becomes big. And everyone in 2023, 2024 is still thinking that, okay, there are still a few years to go for India to become big. But I can tell you that if there was a time, now is the time for you to actually think of your India strategy. And if you don't, then probably five years back, you'd probably be saying, hey, you know what, I should have probably thought about the yeah. India strategy in 2024, right? So, so yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty much where the country is now, yeah. How about you? I mean, for the metaverse, what is the enabling environment, whether it's technology or policy even, to make it happen? So, I mean, for us, when we started the company, there were a billion less people playing video games. And even when we were originally trying to get, you know, thousands of people into a virtual world, there was no Fortnite, there was no, no one had even cracked 100 people kind of networking. We were told repeatedly that no one will ever want to play a game where there are more than the people you see inside a session match of Call of Duty. You know, the games industry is weirdly conservative for yeah. an industry that's about inventing new things. Um, so what, what we needed to see is the social change and the obsession of fans with virtual spaces and a desire to buy and sell digital assets. And that really was a market that was global but growing while we grew. And the, the central challenge we had, and I think there are probably people in the audience really building moonshot companies that are going to have the same challenge, which is, if you're too early, that's just the same as being wrong. Mm. And managing the process of being early or being late and managing cash flow and talent in that time is very, very tough. Deep tech is so much about timing. Um, you know, consider, for example, how many businesses have been enabled by the LLM revolution right now. You know, a lot of companies I've seen who like, were dead in the water, but because of this stuff, now have, now have opportunity. So for me, it's, yeah, it's about market. And also investors. I mean, we were the first company Andreessen Horowitz invested in in the UK. I think, no, it was second, it was TransferWise. But American investors doing this stuff in the UK, that was really unusual. I mean, you know, when you're building a new market, I also wonder whether you're discovering the market as you go. I mean, Herman, you know, it's not been a straight line. Oh, no. You yeah. know, when you took those first massive investments in the UK, people were incredibly proud for someone to be getting big American investments. As you say, you sold off the defense business. There were some of your gaming studios you shut down. Now you're going down the venture building path. I mean, were you figuring it out as you went along? Yeah, so we got very lucky with our game studios. We actually made a lot of money by building game studios and selling them pretty much at the top of the market. Um, and last year, we had a 100 million exit from a consulting business that became the largest consultant for multiplayer networking pretty much across Western publishers. And the confidence to do those things, which were not our core business, but which we tried to do individually as valuable activities, rather than just activities that would try to prove out our tech, was one of the best decisions we ever made. And actually, one of the reasons why we call ourselves a venture builder, why we operate that way, is we've decided to take a very disciplined approach in building what we think of as the technological bones of a new economy. Never try to mingle the deep tech teams with the application teams with services. If you do that, all three of them are crap because all three of them think that they're subsidizing the others. But if you consider your own deep tech company as having individual sub-businesses, you have a much higher likelihood of creating real value. And also, it creates more fear. Every team is like, oh crap, I, our thing has to independently have money. You know, with, um, with the switch to our latest technology, which really blew the doors open for us in the last year, one of the hardest things to do was disrupt our own internal architecture. Spatial OS, which I came here and Slash and talked about, you know, six, seven years ago, was superseded by M squared, and it meant people actually quit the company over it. There were people who'd spent years working on that technology, and that, you know, at the time, an upstart team internally, like, completely wrecked, effectively, their, like, life's work. It was a huge issue. And so as a business, we realized, crap, we're going to be constantly disrupting ourselves to make this work. And so moving forward, I think what we would do is always make new businesses wherever we have new concepts. So for example, we, we've come up with a blockchain that was going to do about four, four 500,000 transactions a second. We went to DevNet last week. It's completely firewalled from the rest of the company. It's like a totally separate thing. There's no obligation to use it. There's no mingling of ideas. Screw all of that. Separate teams doing separate things, acting like unique businesses. Much more likely to succeed. And if they fail, much easier to kill them. I mean, the hiring piece is interesting, right? Because when you're convincing people, and we will get to it convincing investors, but 
convincing someone to work for you when you're doing something totally new and they're young people and their parents are telling them go work for a big name consultancy how did you find that recruitment play yeah. I, I actually think convincing smart people is harder than convincing investors I think yeah, yeah I think Smart builders tend to be smarter than investors, I assume. So nothing against investors. And very cynical, very conservative. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, so so uh, I think really smart engineers, I believe, are the hardest to con uh, uh, convince for the very specific point he said, Fed tend to be very cynical. I think for me, what, what would really help was that my undergrad, I think I went, uh, I had the privilege of uh, going to uh, one of the best engineering schools in, in the country. And I had the opportunity to study with some really capable people and really smart, I mean, people who are way smarter than I am. Um, and, and my co-founder also had a similar privilege. So I think there were these bunch of people who were at the right time and you know, right place in their life where they were in their mid to late 20s. They all worked for a bit. They all made a little bit of money, enough to go for a year or two without a paycheck. And they were all, they were all very eager to take a risk because I think in India then and even now, I think it's become even more now where is that I think it's the thing to do in India to actually start a business. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty much, if you go to Bangalore and if you go to Delhi, if you go to most urban centers in India, I think you'll see the energy fairly visible, right? Everybody wants to do something new. And, and as a consequence, I think that was very helpful. So because my first startup, when we started, which is a hardware company, we had no idea what to do. Like, you know, we, we never built hardware before. And we started that company in 2014. And we ran, it for, we ran that for three years and we eventually shut it down, right, uh, in 2016. Not shut it down, actually, we sold it out. Uh, but then in, in 2018, when we started this, a lot of the people who actually worked there, a bunch of them actually came back and worked here again. So it is, I think it's, it's when, you're, when, you're, when you're trying to recruit people, I think you need to be very mindful of the risk appetite. Uh, and you need to balance the risk appetite with capability. Like if you get a really capable person, but he doesn't have, or he or she doesn't have an appetite for risk, I think it's a bad fit because then they'll come and then they'll keep freaking out every other day when something goes wrong in the company. But you get like a m medium, so it's a reasonably capable person, but who also has a reasonably decent risk appetite. Then I think, you know what, they're going to be fine. They're going to be fine with the ship going this way, that way, and you know, like, you know, uh, uh, in all those close calls. And I think if I look back, I think that's pretty much the reason why we've, we've, we've survived and, and, and hopefully we'll keep thriving for a longer period of time. Yeah. Now the part that I think every founder really cares about, which is how you get someone to give you money. And between the two of you, you've managed to convince pretty much all the biggest names, Sequoia, SoftBank, Anderson Horowitz. Um, you know, Sai, you're particularly interesting because convincing people to put money into emerging markets, which they don't understand, that are far away and seem risky, is difficult. Can you sort of just talk us through those stories, those meetings, those first interactions? How do you convince these people of your market? Uh, I think... Um, I think, like, I'd, I'd probably say it's, yes, there is a little bit of convincing, but I also think a lot of uh, venture capital raising is actually being in the right place, right time. And I think you need to be, you need to, you need to be cognizant and you need to be, like, you know, you need, you need to recognize that, like, you know, not everything is skill, not everything is, you know, us going and convincing people. I think being at the right place, right time makes a big difference. And, and, and the reason why I say that is because if we as a company started maybe, uh, two years late, I think we would have probably not been able to raise half the money that we did because, you know, the markets eventually went south and then I think now venture markets are coming back. So I think first I want to preface this by saying that there's always a right place, right time element to, to raising capital. I think for us what really worked was, uh, uh, you know, that we had a really experienced set of people. When I say experienced people who've built a company before, exited the company before, and we had a track record of returning capital. So the fact that, you know, that, that this is a founding team that's actually built a company, ran that company for three years, and successfully returned money. In some, for, for some of our early investors in the first company, we, we made a meaningful return, but for the later ones, we ensured that we just returned their money. I think that, 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 that went a long way. And in the venture business, uh, you know, if, if, you have an, if you have a founder who's actually done that once, that gives a lot of confidence to the market and to the other venture capital investors around in the industry. I think that allowed us to actually bang at the get-go raise about five, five and a half million when we were starting. And that, that was a pretty large seed round uh, back in the day. I mean, now it's pretty much a very average seed round, but back in 2018, it was a fairly sizable seed round. And, and, and I think that was because we were very responsible with our first company. And, and I think that, that went a long way. And the fact that I, I worked with, I mean, I had, a, I had a history in gaming, and since I worked in a, in a good gaming company and learned 
and, and, and I had a reasonably decent reputation, I guess. So I think that helped. But I think right place, right time, and uh, you know, if you have a track record, then it, it dramatically helps. The first time, you have to have to just sell. You have to just keep going and selling as many people as possible. Uh, and in fact, in the first company when we raised, uh, the first $250,000 was the hardest to raise. Yeah. And, and it, took, it took a long, long time to get that money uh, uh, to us. And, and it took a lot of people as well. I had to go convince a lot of people. People wrote individual checks. But the next time around, when we were raising for the second company, it, it was pretty much one week, and we raised five million, right? I think, I think that's, it's not a linear thing, you know? <laughs> Track record compounds exponentially, and, 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 and I think the more, the more you the more you ensure that your you know your track record speaks for itself, it tends to keep compounding. Yeah, so I think that's yeah. pretty much what I what I said. And how many? You know, if you're starting a business in an area where there is no benchmark for unit economics, you know, product market fit is not a thing. We don't know this market. How did? I mean, you're now on the investor side, I guess. How do you go around? figuring out what works. I mean, it's fantastic to invest in such companies and to work with those kinds of partners because nobody wants to. Every venture capitalist believes that they want to invest in disruptive and unique things. But I think if you put an actually disruptive and unique thing in front of most VCs, they run away terrified. And the reason for that is now we're in a world, you know, when we started, we had the privilege of, of raising capital from people who had been great entrepreneurs before. The reality is the vast majority of people currently investing in technology have never started a company before. So you've got somebody who's never started a company before giving money to somebody who's never started a company before, <laughs> all apparently evaluating each other, right? It's like going to a hospital and no one's a doctor. <laughs> and everyone is, you know, and of course it's all complete bullshit, right? And you see that bullshit and I think it's good to have a sense of humor about it. Now that I'm on the investor side, I'm just like, is this meeting for real? Are we, are we really having this conversation? Like, you know, it, it's wild. I mean, I've been in board meetings where um, investors have been in that board meeting for you know, a company I'm, I'm advising helping with and no one figured out that the company was running out of money, like in the room. So on the screen, but nobody noticed that. And I was like, I don't know why I had to point that out. And then obviously they did a round. So I guess this is a long-winded way of saying, don't be disheartened if when you're doing something unique and new, people don't just say no, they go out of their way to try to explain to you why what you're doing could never possibly work and where you seem completely lost in your fundraising path. And I think I would agree very much with what you said, which is I would enhance it a bit. Right place, right time is important, but it's important to understand that your equity is also a product. And that product has to be designed and thought through. Who's it for? Who's the market that will invest in this? What are you really selling? Are you selling something that is going to be cognitively easy for them or something that is going to require them to experience a lot of pain with you for a long period of time? And trying to work backwards from what you're selling will help you understand who you're selling it to. The other thing to bear in mind is metrics can always be added to a business. So one, one thing I think that we evolved with you know, 10 years later, we used to say, like, like you just did, like, oh, you know, you can't value this stuff. How do you even know what it looks like? You can, though, right? You, you can get into understanding a business's potential unit economics, especially if you're deep tech founders. You can kind of go deep, and, and I think it's very important to have a plan, financial plan of some kind. You know, the investors that don't ask you for one or don't want to see one, they're either really, really good or really, really bad. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's important to kind of, um, you know, to, to come prepare for that. And the last thing I'd say is um, team members should understand how poisonous fundraising is. I've raised almost uh, $800 million plus for different companies that we've set up. We're, we're almost constantly fundraising to help founders who we're engaged with. When you come out of the fundraising space, it's a bit like going on a night out. You afterwards, you're like, where am I? What am I? What's my customer? Because you spend all of your time not thinking about your customers. You spend yeah. all of your time not thinking about employees. You spend all of your time imagining that PowerPoint presentation is a business and it isn't. So you almost need a decompression system. And I think if you have a co-founder, it's important to understand which co-founder will eye the business and which co-founder is going to go out and sell to investors and make sure that you don't make decisions in a mixed up way uh, between the two. Yeah, yeah super I, interesting. I think just one thing to add, I think when you're raising for a very ambitious business, you should also go and choose the right kind of investor. Because exactly. there's some investors, I mean, if, if in India, I can, I mean, there's, there are select investors who would take the big swings and be very comfortable taking like a crazy, you know, uh, 100x to zero outcome. Some investors are more steady. So if you're going and pitching a crazy 100x outcome to a steady investor, bad idea. So you need to find the right one uh, also. And we should give some practical advice as well. If any of this sounds familiar, come pitch me. I would very <laughs> much like to hear about your business. Um, especially if every single person has told you that it's a complete waste of time and it's deep tech in any way, I'm very interested in that. God rather you than me. Yeah. Um, you know, the last part of this is, right, so you've created a market, you've created demand, you've got money, and if it's kind of working, you're going to find other people doing it. You're going to face competition. And that thing that was hard, which was being doing the new thing that was difficult, 
And there's a new difficult thing, which is dealing with competition. Yeah. Um, you know, in India now, there are sort of several gaming companies out there, lots of digital platforms. How do you learn to basically tackle competition? Yeah, I think uh, uh, it's a hard learned lesson. Uh, uh, I hope this is what I'm saying actually turns out to be true, reasonably true so far. I think uh, the best way to tackle competition is to master the paradox, like what he said, like you, you, you don't disturb the businesses that are generating your cash flow and generating your EBITDA and profit and you keep those businesses and you run those businesses with a steady bent to mind. You get the right kind of people to actually run that business with discipline and with the right you know, method that it needs to that it needs to be. For example, starting a new thing, starting from scratch, is probably a bit something that doesn't need method. You need people who are probably going to go all the way to the extreme and try something crazy. Uh, so, so these are two very different skills. So therefore, you keep that business, which is, run, which is your cash flow business, keep it nice, keep it running well, and ensure that there are disciplined people running it. But then on the other side, you, know, you, you need to have that, uh, you need to master that paradox of either investing in newer businesses out of your own cash flow, or like what he said, keep the deep tech guys away. Don't 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 mingle them with the other set of folks, right? Keep them away and let them do let them do their thing. And you're measuring them purely on the fact that hey, you know what? You're not being measured on revenue. You're not being measured on the EBITDA that you're generating, but you're being measured on if you were to ship a product, how many users are going to use your product, and is it going to is it going to work or not? So I think for us, also that what what worked very well for us also is that we've 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 also kind of you know, gone outside India and has actually invested out in businesses outside India. In fact, we, we've acquired this uh, incredible gaming studio in Germany, uh, um, which is now, now, over the last two years, has now become the second largest free-to-play gaming studio in Germany. And, 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 and I think well, their success is remarkable. And sometimes going outside India, especially when you're in India, you tend to think India is the world because it's such a big country, so many people, everything is just so crazy all the time, right? But the moment you step out, you realize that there's this whole big world, there's Europe, there's US, and this. And in fact, some of, some of these markets are way bigger than India, in fact. So, you know, sometimes acquiring a business outside and having that also dramatically helps you because it's a bit of an anti-fragile strategy in since you have something mm -hmm. there, which none of the guys in India know. And they, they, don't, they don't understand some of these things. So it's, it's always good to have a global business, especially in gaming in that way. So I think a combination of these things helps. I mean, I, I'd, I'd probably kind of offer very different advice. I think for the stage you're describing, that's the right approach. And for the kind of consumer business you're talking about, that's, uh, that's flawless. I think if you're in the deep tech space, so let's imagine you're coming up with, I don't know, a, uh, a new distributed protocol for a, a different approach to a blockchain, or you're trying to build something that is in healthcare that no one's thought of, competition is your friend, because competition is a signal that you're not completely insane. If one other person is trying to do this, then you're probably not wrong. And the other benefit of competition, and we found this, is that they educate your customer. Mm. So when you have that first meeting with that buyer, and he's like, I don't even know what the hell you're selling. If they've already heard another pitch, at least somebody else has, has defined terms. We had a couple of companies that tried to fast follow Improbable on the networking side. And it was really funny, because we'd change our website, and then they changed theirs on pretty much within a week. And that was very helpful to us, because we could test, we could A-B test our messaging <laughs> using their marketing team, right, in order to understand whether it would work out. Um, I think competition only really becomes an issue at the point at which you, you know, you, you're actually beginning to see customers tell you that they would rather buy something else. I think at that point, you need to totally orient how you, how you build your business. But until that point, it's a huge distraction to think about. It's hard enough to do deep tech and to focus on your customer. I, I would personally not think about that until you've established a market. It's going to be pretty useful when Facebook rebrands itself meta. That was a great, great couple <laughs> months for us, yeah. And even now, I think Facebook's uh, challenges there have been very helpful too, because investors are unwilling to compete with the core technology we're attacking. There's very, I mean, we don't no longer need capital for that, but it's very hard now to raise when we exist and when Facebook has had its, uh, had its journey, because as we've discussed earlier, most investors are following a pattern or a trend, yeah. right? So last minute. Founders stage, so lots of founders in the audience. If you could go back 10 years, I mean, you started in 2018, but let's say 10 years, what's one thing you wish you could tell yourself? Oh, the one, oh, uh, that's easy. Uh, so the one thing I wish I'd tell myself is, you know, just take your time. Uh, investors want you to do everything fast, but uh, really take your time. I think nothing's changing, the market's not going anywhere. Take your time. More often than not, if you take your time and just spend money in a more thoughtful way, you, inevitably it, it benefits the company, the management and the founders. Whenever you kind of try to race through the blocks, more often than not you end up making a mistake and it benefits, say, <laughs> investors. Yeah. How about you? 
I think if I could go back in time, I would say to myself, it's going to take you a hell of a lot longer to do this than you think it will. <laughs> and to your point, Same often, <laughs> well, no, but often the things that I thought were making us move faster were yeah. just trading time. It was just, it was actually slowing you down yeah. more than it was making you go quicker. And the last thing I'd probably tell myself is it's okay to kill things. You know, like I think mm. when you, 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 you got your identity as a business, if you're doing something disruptive, shouldn't be in the method of your solution. It'll almost certainly change. It's a great place to finish. So take your time and don't be scared to give up. It's not what I expected you to say. Thank you guys so much for being with us. Um, and thank you guys as well. Appreciate it. Bye. Bye.